staying safe in sort of this uh, very unusual year. Um, it's very exciting to be here. Um, so, I'm, so I'm Maitra. Um, this, my, my talk today will be on do wide and deep neural networks learn the same things. Uh, this is based off of a, a paper of almost the same name uh, with my amazing collaborators, uh, Tao and Simon, uh, and, and we're all like Google AI. Um, so for this talk, I thought I'd actually first start off by giving um, a little bit of background and context as to what motivated us to, to look into this direction in the, the first place and, and sort of some of our overarching research goals in, in pursuing this project um, and some of the other directions we've been working on. Um, so with that in mind, um, sort of really big step back, and um, I'll just say that, as we sort of all know, um, over the, the past several years, um, the field of sort of machine learning has been just an amazing place to be in. Um, we've seen these like incredible breakthroughs, starting all the way with speech recognition, and then computer vision, machine translation, uh, more recently, uh, more complex tasks like uh, pose estimation and dialogue. And um, this has all really been made possible uh, because of the rapid iteration and advancement of these deep neural network models uh, on these specific competition benchmarks. Uh, so things like ImageNet and MS Coco and computer vision, uh, benchmarks in machine translation, uh, the glue, super glue and squad benchmarks in natural language understanding. Um, there are a huge number of these. Um, in fact, there are so many of these that there are sort of all these websites that are actually dedicated to keeping track of all the benchmarks we have um, and how the models and algorithms we're proposing are, are slowly getting better and, and doing well at all of these tasks. Okay, so that's sort of kind of field so far. Um, and, and what's happened is that sort of all of this progress and development of these benchmarks um, has meant that uh, looking forwards, we're able to push the boundaries of our field um, in sort of brand new ways. Um, so we're seeing sort of two two big kinds of um, two big sort of um, different pushes, I think. Um, firstly, we're seeing the development of models of sort of scale larger than we've ever had before. Um, and sort of systems that are very complex in nature have sort of many learned and moving parts um, and are capable of tackling um, all kinds of like new tasks. Um, and this, so that's kind of one part. And then on the, the second side, um, we're also seeing just a huge amount of excitement from all of these different applications and domains in, in deploying these systems that we've been developing uh, to, to deal with some of the key pain points um, in their domain. And, and this includes really high stakes applications, things like medicine and healthcare. So, so sort of summary is sort of looking back, things were exciting and looking forwards, things also look really exciting for the field. Uh, but there's an important caveat here. Um, and the caveat is that, you know, if we want to continue pushing things forward the, the, in this way, we want to continue developing these sort of very complex models. Uh, we want to continue developing large scale systems. We want to be able to sort of safely and reliably deploy these systems in sort of these, these other domains. Um, then we have to be able to design uh, very robust and sort of high quality uh, models and algorithms. And, and that's where there's this, this gap. Despite all of the forward progress we've made, um, this design process for these machine learning systems um, is still sort of incredibly uh, complex and involved. Um, so say sort of, you know, you're faced with this, this task of designing some new machine learning system. Um, well, that process is just uh, so complicated. You're faced with like all of these different choices, uh, ranging from the kind of model you should use to questions around the data, how you should train it, um, hyper parameters and questions around the learning algorithm. Um, and, and the big problem facing us is that we actually have to pick carefully amongst these choices uh, to end up with a high quality robust system. Um, but at, at the same time, there's very little insight guiding what a good set of these choices looks like. Um, so we end up with a design process that's, um, you know, pretty laborious and, and computationally expensive um, because people don't know what to do. So they try out a whole bunch of different things. And so they will literally build up this, this population of neural networks, um, each one which sort of has some specific set of design choices associated with it. Um, and then the hope is that sort of amongst this population, uh, there's, there's something there that's, that's doing what they want it to. Now, now, this is the place where I think there's also this interesting gap between science and engineering. So on the engineering side, we have actually seen remarkable progress in sort of making this, this entire process uh, much easier. Um, from the development of sort of software packages to really help us um, to, to actually design, um, to actually write the code for these, these models better, uh, to things like people here at Weights and Biases are doing and actually developing tools to sort of monitor and visualize these systems, uh, to, to, to things that help us like navigate our, our compute architecture and load. 
Um, but the place where I see a gap and where we need to catch up is sort of um, the, 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 sci the science side of it. Um, so in kind of measuring how sort of our, our models and uh, uh, um, deep learning systems are doing, um, we're still sort of falling back um, to these sort of metrics of like loss and accuracy, um, which are sort of historically inherited uh, from this history of developing these systems on these, these competition benchmarks. Um, and you know, that, that's nice, like that, that is a good place to start. Uh, but, but there's a limitation to how much these can offer us if we really care about principled design processes. Um, so sort of most kind of obviously, um, these sort of loss and accuracy metrics um, are pretty much concentrated on what's happening at the very output, the very top layer of these deep learning models. Uh, whereas sort of the bulk of the computation, the parameters and, and the learning happens in sort of all of these hidden layers. Um, and, you know, we still have to kind of take steps. I mean, ideally what we want is sort of a suite of techniques that will let us um, understand what's going on there. Um, now, these hidden layers also pose challenges for us to analyze in this way. They're sort of large, they're complex, uh, they don't have any kind of nice interpretable mapping. Um, but the, the kind of questions that started us off um, sort of many years ago into this, this paper I'm about to present um, is just that we, we at least wanted to be able to take, you know, different members of our population and, and sort of understand how these different design choices were affecting their hidden representations. Um, what's similar and what's different because of all these design choices we made? What, what's really going on? And sort of boiling this down, um, what we were really hoping to do is meaningfully compare hidden representations uh, across neural networks. Now, this seems like a really fundamental question, uh, but even sort of this fundamental question has some layers of sort of subtlety uh, and, and complexity to it. Um, and I don't know if I can do sort of full justice to it in, in the time, but I'll, I'll try and give some um, like some of the key um, things to, uh, to think about when, when doing this. Um, so, so first of all, there's this um, definitional question of how we actually should uh, define a hidden representation. Um, normally we think of neural networks in terms of their parameters, uh, but there's lots of redundancy in their parameters. Uh, so it turns out that um, a more effective approach is to actually uh, think of the, the concrete outputs uh, that a particular hidden neuron is emitting on, on some data set of interest, or, or sort of expanding this out to a, a layer. Um, we, can, we can think of the representation of a layer as, as being represented um, by what we call an activation matrix. So sort of all of the outputs of all of its neurons on some data set of interest. And this sort of summarizes the, the representation learned by the layer. Um, the, the other challenge in sort of comparing representations, um, which I'll just um, which, yeah, briefly mention, is sort of representations are distributed across neural networks. Uh, there's also no nice alignment. Um, so whatever algorithm you come up with has to take all of those into account. Um, so bearing, bearing these conditions in mind, in sort of work done a, a few years ago now, um, we proposed some of the first algorithms to, to actually do this in sort of a quantitative and, and reliable way. Um, and we were able to, to use that to um, provide us lots of interesting insights about what's actually happening with these systems, how hidden layers are really converging, um, sort of the differences between networks that are sort of overfitting or memorizing versus actually generalizing well. And sort of building off of this, um, more recently, uh, there was a paper that really advanced um, the, the core algorithm for performing these kinds of comparisons of hidden representations in neural networks. Um, and so this algorithm is known as the CKA algorithm. Uh, and the way it works is it's going to take in uh, two, set, two, two layer activation matrices, so some layer one and, and layer two. Um, and then it's going to map those into just a scalar similarity score. That's just simply telling us, well, sort of how similar are these representations? So zero is they're totally different, and one is sort of they're identical. Um, and this algorithm is going to be a very important lens for the question we're about uh, to investigate. Um, so, so going back to this kind of uh, picture of design challenges, um, the question we really wanted to investigate is better understand um, sort of all these different models people were playing with and sort of how the representations actually learned amongst these models um, might vary amongst them. Um, and, and in particular, one trend that we're seeing as of late is that people are looking at actually playing with the, the total model capacity by varying the depth and the width of the model. So we've seen this across all kinds of um, sort of um, imaging models, ResNets, ResNex, efficient nets, efficient nets, um, more recently transformers. Um, and sort of two key hyperparameters people play with here are sort of um, actually changing the model depth and, and the model width. 
Um, and oftentimes, you know, the resulting model is very performant, uh, but we wanted to understand how these might be affecting uh, the, the hidden representations um, for which there are many open questions. Um, so sort of concretely, you know, are there any differences if we just look into a single model um, and sort of, um, you know, uh, look at what it's actually learning is, is kind of depth and width affecting that in any clear way. Um, if we take models that look very different to each other architecturally, you know, are they learning the same thing? Um, and, you know, are there even sort of characteristic errors that might be associated um, with these kinds of different neural network architectures? Those are some of the questions we were interested in. Um, and so to, to study this, uh, we turned to, you know, sort of um, very simple setup. Uh, we took sort of ResNets, uh, which are a family of, of models in image classification that have already, you know, um, been um, in, in practice have sort of their depth and width uh, varied. Um, so we sort of took a family of models where we could kind of vary their depth and width in this way. Um, and we looked at training them on these sorts of um, standard image classification tasks, uh, things like CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, ImageNet. Um, and then sort of on these, using CKA as a lens, uh, we went in to study what was happening in their hidden representations. Um, and so um, in, in particular, um, CKA actually lets us, it's a very flexible tool and lets us compare any pair of um, hidden layers with each other. Um, and so to represent some of the results, um, we, we kind of turned to showing things as a heat map. Um, so what we have here is we have a neural network. Um, and so along the x axis, we have sort of the layers um, corresponding to, to one neural network. Um, along the y axis, we have the layers corresponding to another neural network. Um, and these might be sort of the same network. These might be different networks. These might be networks that have two different kinds of architectures. It doesn't really matter. Um, we can kind of do all of these pairwise comparisons. And, and the plan is to sort of show it as a heat map. Um, sort of by convention, we sort of had the input in the kind of bottom left corner. So the output is sort of the top layer on the sort of the right and sort of upper half. Um, and then for sort of any pair of layers that we could compare, um, we can just sort of go into their, their corresponding um, grid cell and, and fill it in with their CKA similarity score. Um, so, okay, so that's kind of like the, the schematic. Um, let's see what this actually looks like. Um, so, so here are sort of two different ResNets. Um, so again, along the end, so this time it's um, the, the model we're comparing is actually the same architecture. So both in the left and the right, we're taking the same ResNet model and sort of just comparing all of its hidden representations to, um, to itself. Um, so along the x-axis, you have sort of all of the, the layers. And then along the y-axis, you sort of have the same layers. Um, so, so in this heat map, you know, yellow sort of colored is sort of maximal CKA similarity one, whereas um, black is zero. Um, along the diagonal, you can, you know, kind of reassuringly, you can see this nice yellow line. And that's because you're comparing each layer with itself. So of course, its representation is identical. Um, if you kind of peer at this more closely, you can see um, other kind of cool artifacts um, from the result of this being a ResNet. Uh, so you sort of see this um, grid-like pattern, and that's because of the skip connections of the ResNet coming in. Um, if you sort of stare even closer, you can see um, sort of like a three-block styled structure, and, and that's due to the different stages uh, that the ResNet has. Okay, um, so this is kind of, you know, what, what things look like. Um, but, but what happens to these heat maps as we vary depth and width? Uh, well, uh, when we do that, um, the result is actually really striking. Uh, so, so this is kind of what happens when we vary depth and width. So the top, um, top row is what happens as we slowly make the architecture deeper. Um, bottom row is what happens as we slowly make the architecture wider. Um, and what you can kind of really clearly see is um, what we call a block structure um, emerging um, in the representations. Um, and sort of if, if you're following it on, um, following along, um, you'll sort of uh, see that like kind of this, this block structure in, 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 um, in words, what it really means is that we sort of have this large set of contiguous layers um, that have these really high CKA scores. Um, so very high uh, representation similarity. Um, so that was really exciting. Uh, we went ahead and you know did some work to check this as a robust phenomenon, things like that. And it does just very reliably appear um, in these sorts of wide and deep models. Um, so, 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 so this sort of suggests that this block structure maybe has some connection to the actual um, model capacity. Um, and so, so we wanted to check whether you know, this is really the case. Is there some interventional experiment we could do to, to really establish this connection? Um, and, and one nice experiment you can do is you can increase model capacity um, artificially by reducing the, um, the training data set size. And so we went ahead and did this. Um, and, and sort of, um, so as you kind of go down, like in each column, you're sort of decreasing the training data set size. 
Um, and sort of indeed what you see is as you decrease the training data set size, um, you're sort of seeing this block structure emerge in, in models that, that didn't have a block structure uh, in their representations anymore. Um, so, so that was um, that was super interesting to see, um, and then sort of based off of this in the um, paper, we sort of did um, f further analysis of all of this. Um, but okay, so although so 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 far, you know, we've kind of developed, we've kind of uh, talked about like some of the motivation for the CKA algorithm. Um, we've dived into the representations of, of a model, and we've seen that when we make them sort of wider or deeper, um, you know, performance-wise, they're still doing great. Um, but their representations are getting this block structure, and this block structure is indeed linked with the actual capacity of the model. Uh, but to us, there was still a, a gap in sort of all of this, which is we still didn't understand sort of functionally what the block structure was really doing to the representations. So we were seeing this high representation similarity, but sort of layer by layer, what was really going on in the representations through the block structure? Okay, so, so how, how, how should we go about studying that? Well, if we you know, take a few steps back and, and think about what we were doing with the CKA algorithm, um, what we were doing is we were taking these different layer activation matrices, and then we were sort of performing this the CKA algorithm to, to compare them. Um, and so instead, we went for something kind of even more low level. Uh, we looked at just studying the principal components of the layer activation matrix. And it turned out that a very important question to ask was how important is the first principal component of these representations? Um, and, and what we found is that um, the first principal component was extremely important for models that had um, the block structure. Uh, so, so, over, so what we did is you can sort of take, you know, the different layers of the network that's sort of shown in the x-axis going from input all the way to output. Um, and then you can, um, on the y-axis, you sort of have the, the fraction of variance explained. So for every single layer, we take um, sort of the fraction of variance explained by just the first principal component. Um, and sort of what's really obvious here is you can see these two big sort of um, spikes. And these spikes actually correspond perfectly with where we're seeing the block structure when we do this sort of uh, the CKA analysis. Uh, and in fact, if we then remove the first principal component of the representations, uh, well, then the block structure is significantly reduced. Uh, so with this experiment and sort of others like this, we were able to really pinpoint the functional property of the block structure. Um, so in these sort of high capacity models, um, the block structure worked to preserve and propagate the first principal component of these representations. So this is kind of a really nice summary of what was happening in the internals of, of a single model. Uh, and so sort of informed by this, uh, we, we turned into the question that motivated us to, to start this paper in the first place, which was, well, what, what's happening in representations across models? You know, are wide and deep neural networks learning the same things? Um, and, you know, it turns out to be a really good starting point to start uh, by looking at a single model because there's an important connection between the block structure and representations across models. Um, so as the first simple comparison to see what was happening across models, uh, we just looked at different random seeds. So now we're applying CK, we're now we're sort of computing these CKA heat maps, but these CKA heat maps are between models that are just different random seeds. So same architecture, but different random seeds. Um, and there's this kind of important distinction between models that don't have the block structure and models that do. Um, so with models that uh, don't have the block structure, um, well, along the diagonal, we're actually comparing sort of the model to itself, no block structure here. Um, but most importantly, in the off diagonal, where we're sort of comparing models of, of different random seeds, um, you can actually see there's a decent amount of, of similarity. Um, in fact, between um, the same random seed and different random seeds, um, there's, you know, it looks pretty similar, except for sort of this strong diagonal line, which is because in same random seeds, it's, it's identical representations. Um, so sort of in, in summary, we're actually seeing similar features across these different seeds. But when models have the block structure, the story is different. Um, so of course, across the diagonal, you know, you're sort of seeing this, this nice block structure. But in the off diagonal, um, you're seeing this big sort of uh, lack of similarity, um, pretty much precisely where the block structure is. And so sort of put another way, um, the block structure is actually unique to each of these seeds. It's a, it's a unique representation learned by these models.
Um, so this is different random seeds. Um, you can do this sort of um, same same analysis for, for different model architectures. Um, and again, there's sort of this um, difference between um, things that have the block structure and things that uh, things that don't have the block structure. Okay. Um, so 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 to summarize things um, sort of so far, um, we've kind of been uh, varying the kind of depth and width of these different models um, by sort of analyzing their internals. We've gotten uh, sort of this characteristic property of their representations for these large capacity models, this block structure. And we've also gone on to try and understand, uh, you know, how, how this um, affects sort of representations learned across different models um, and come to this conclusion that for, well, do wide and deep networks learn the same things? Well, they learn the same things when they don't have a block structure. Uh, but when they do have a block structure, uh, you are seeing that there's some, you unique set of features learned by each model. Um, so to complete this study, um, we actually return to thinking about um, the actual predictions of the model. So you know we're typically evaluating the model just by looking at its output. And so as sort of a final kind of question, we wanted to understand uh, whether there were clear differences in the actual predictions and errors being made uh, by, um, by models that had um, different architectural structures. Um, and so uh, to, to, to do this final study, um, what we were doing is we were training a population of networks that had a certain architecture on some task. Um, and then we were comparing to a population of networks um, also trained on that task, but maybe with a different architecture. Um, and so the important kind of, uh, kind of quantitative thing to note here is that when you have a population of architectures trained on some task, say architecture A, um, we can actually um, think about the accuracy of that population. Uh, so we can take a particular data point and then we can compute say P A of X, which is the sort of probability that uh, everything with architecture A um, classifies X correctly. Um, and same for B, and you can do this at a class level also. So there are sort of two different kind of uh, um, granularities here. There's at a data point level and at a class level. Okay. Um, and so sort of with these um, populations trained, we looked at comparing um, accuracies and errors at a data point level and at a class level. Um, and so the results um, actually varied a little bit on the data sets. Uh, so on CIFAR 10, we didn't really see any statistically significant class level differences. Um, but when we looked at the per example level, uh, we did see uh, that architectures that are more uh, si similar in structure have actually more similar predictions. Um, so here sort of um, on, on the X and Y axes, we are precisely plotting this sort of PA of X and, and sort of PB of X for, for every single um, one of these um, data points X. Um, and so um, on sort of the left plot here, we're kind of comparing a deep network with a wide network. Uh, and you can see that things are very far out from sort of the Y equals X line. Um, so there are lots of data points which have a very different um, sort of accuracy um, for architecture A uh, compared to architecture B. Um, whereas in comparison, when you compare a deep architecture to a deep architecture or wide architecture to a wide, wide architecture, things are much more concentrated um, along the y equals x line. Um, and there are many, many more experiments here um, that are that are in our paper, so do check it out. Um, and then finally, um, on ImageNet, what was interesting is that we saw class and example level differences. Um, and because there are sort of these um, class level differences, we were actually able um, to identify some, some characteristic errors. Um, so, so over here um, along the uh, x axis sort of well we, we have sort of a, a very deep network again and sort of a wide network. Um, the dots in orange are sort of a baseline so they're sort of just the wide um, the deep network minus the deep network, um, whereas the the dots in blue are sort of the the, the actual result we care about measuring um, they're sort of the the population accuracy of the wide network um, subtracting the population accuracy of the deep network. Um, so sort of translating all of that, um, things sort of um, so things with sort of positive y value are places where the wide model is doing better. Um, and things with sort of negative uh, y value are places where the deep model is doing better. Um, and so here we're sort of broadly seeing this interesting bias where maybe the wide model is doing a little bit better on scenes, um, whereas the deep model is doing better on objects. Okay, so um, Baitra, a quick question from uh -huh. YouTube uh, from <laughs> Tyler. Uh, back one slide, were the deep, deep and wide, wide experiments on ResNets with different seeds? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So they have the same architecture, just different seeds. 
Um, yeah, so, so in this case, it's sort of same architecture as different seeds, and you're sort of seeing the amounts of variance you'd naturally get thanks to sort of just like, um, I guess, sort of sampling differences. Um, but in the paper, we sort of, I, they just didn't fit on the slides, um, but we have this nice interpolation going from sort of things that are um, sort of like very deep versus things that are sort of very wide, um, and sort of what does the spread look like. And what you can broadly see is that architectures that are sort of both kind of might classify as deep, but not the same architecture, um, do look a bit more concentrated along the, the y equals x uh, line than, than kind of going from the deep to like the very sort of wide architecture, for instance. Got it. That's a great experiment. Thanks for sharing. Um, OK, so um, back to this. So, so to summarize, um, in ImageNet, um, I think the interesting kind of addition was sort of this, this class level difference. Um, and so I'll just sort of uh, summarize. Um, so um, sort of, again, as kind of broader motivation, you know, we kind of um, the, this was sort of really inspired by the fact that we um, really need measures that give us more insights into the internals of these systems to, to really help um, inform sort of um, principled and robust um, design processes. Um, that sort of really motivated a whole line of work, including uh, CKA, um, that we use to sort of um, study, give us insights into internals of these systems through representational similarity. Um, and this was kind of really the tool we used to study lots of properties of networks as we varied their width and depth. Um, specifically, we sort of saw this block structure component in networks of large capacity. We're able to kind of really interventionally link that to the capacity um, of the network. Um, and, and most sort of satisfyingly, I guess, we're really able to pinpoint what this block structure does functionally. It sort of preserves and propagates this first principle component. Um, and, and, and this turns out to have be very important when we think about what's going on across different models. Um, model architectures that without the block structure do share features, um, but the block structure sort of uniquely learned to each model. Um, and we also observe these sorts of um, differences in actual um, predictions, uh, which are influenced by like the actual architecture of the model. Um, and on ImageNet, these sorts of characteristic errors. Um, so that's some of the things we covered. I think there are lots of um, really exciting open questions in this space. Um, so firstly, I think there's a big open question on the dynamics of the block structure. So how is it really learned? Um, and sort of like, you know, how, how, yeah, how does it evolve and sort of how stable is it? Things like that. Um, there are sort of um, nice questions on other architectures and other tasks. Uh, we informally got told that um, the block structure has also been um, observed in things like transformers. And I think it would be really um, interesting to investigate that. Um, and then there are sort of questions, again, maybe related to the block structure on sort of, is this sort of an overfitting thing? Is this a key feature? Sort of why, why does it exist, basically? Um, okay, and so with that, I will wrap up. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. And I guess, Charles, you might have some questions. Yeah, I'll take a few uh, minutes to ask you some questions. Want to make sure that we get a chance folks who are online can ask questions in the Zoom as well. Uh, I guess my first question is, I mean, so you partly address this by mentioning transformers. How much do you think that this block structure propagating this first principal component uh, this of the gram matrix, do you think that that's really a ResNet specific thing because they have this um, because they have this capacity to just pass information through an identity transformation? Or do you think that that's something that you might observe in, say, like a VGG type architecture? Yeah, so um, so the reason we focused on ResNets is because like kind of these skip connections are really sort of useful and important for I guess stabilizing things as, as you go deeper. Um, but in the paper, we actually have additional results sort of without the residual connections and stuff. And you you do take a bit of a performance hit. But on the other hand, you do see the same sort of thing with the the, the block structure um, and sort of yeah like those sort of very similar properties. Um, so I do I do think um, and especially given sort of I mean this is informal so I think this is a, a definite exciting open question that would be really cool to go after but um, I think you know transformers would be great to look at and the fact that somebody informally said that they think they'd seen something like that in transformers so I think that would be mm -hmm. um, a really nice sort of uh, thing to verify on. Yeah, that's cool. I think my current mental model for transformers comes from that hop field is all you need paper that oh. like a lot of what's going on there, like some of the some of the pieces, the attention heads are kind of pulling out averages and then some of them are pulling out more fine grained information. It'd be right. interesting to see if there's a connection between that idea and what's going on here. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, what other hyperparameters? It seems like you may have sort of fixed a lot of the hyperparameters uh, besides the width and depth. So things like how many max pools and comms you're doing, the kernel sizes, uh, whether you're using batch norm, when you're using it. Do you think any of those other 
kinds of arch of hyperparameters that are maybe not quite as architectural still impact maybe the block structure or other factors about representations? Do you think that this is something that's going to stay the same no matter what you change there? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I think some things like probably batch norm, I would, my, my, my prior would be like, they don't necessarily have to affect things too much. Um, so our, our goal is, so we want to vary within depth because that felt like a number of sort of things that, you know, were manageable to like vary and sort of do experiments with. Um, and then we kind of want to keep um, every everything else uh, stable. Um, I think other other kind of design things, yeah, the other next kind of thing to look at on the vision side um, would be sort of like maybe things like kernel size or like kind of receptive field size. I guess this is kind of stepping into the data, the the, um, the actual input data itself. But you could look at kind of playing with the, the resolution of the input data, for instance, and try and understand whether um, sort of how that affects things. Uh, my hypothesis would be that like, Somehow, if if increasing the resolution of the data somehow you know really inflating the kind of effective data set size, um, then I think you know you might need sort of larger models before you start seeing the the block structure. But I think otherwise, I would still sort of expect to see um, something like this. Mm -hmm. One idea that's come out of the neural tangent kernel literature and the people thinking about like scaling limits of neural networks uh -huh. is that it's very easy to end up with a with a, a really big neural network that ends up collapsing down to a kernel machine right, right. where it's really effectively it's like you're only training that last right. linear readout layer. Right, Do you right. think there might be a connection between what you're seeing with these big block sizes that seem to be maybe a collapse in the representation uh, and that idea? Do you think those are unrelated? Um, so I'm not sure. So like you, you'll have to tell me because I haven't been following that literature sort of um, extremely closely as of late. Um, but mm -hmm. I also thought you took like a little bit of a performance hit when you sort of did that. Um, and I, I need to check because I know it varies also depending on the architecture. Like maybe mm -hmm. convolutional networks, you maybe see a performance hit, but then maybe for fully connected models, you don't. Um, and then like there's, yeah, there's, there's a ton of work out there. Um, but mm -hmm. here, um, I think they might be different things because I think here, um, like you're not, um, like, I, I don't think you're sort of just starting with this and it's sort of like, you're just not um, sort of like, you know, it's sort of not training at all. I think it's um, more sort of like the, somehow something about the dynamics of learning is resulting in sort of this sort of propagation sort of happening. Um, mm. So so I think those would be uh, different, but um, but that's also an interesting question. So that that's that's worth investigating. Um, but, but, oh yeah, sorry, one other thing is just, yeah, so the, the other motivation for doing this is that so, you know, like, um, I guess back on some work on like expressiveness and stuff, um, depth and width are sort of these parameters that we've sort of mathematically studied in various ways. Like you randomly initialize a network and like look at its depth and width and understand what's expressive, what's efficient to express for models of different architectures. Um, but sort of the real motivation for doing this was, can we just take a bunch of models that are sort of very close to like what people would kind of be tempted to do in practice if they wanted to increase model capacity or something? Um, and can we test them out and sort of then understand what's happening with their representations? Um, so indeed, I think one really cool thing to me is that a whole bunch of these architectures that we tried with sort of varying depth and width, like performance wise, they really look pretty identical. Um, and it's only probing into the representations that you sort of see uh, this this property. So, so the, that was really cool to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is interesting that you see like the top line accuracy can be very similar, but then the classes on which they're getting the best accuracy and the worst accuracy look different. That's a really cool result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, that's all the time we have for our first talk. So thanks a lot, Mitra, for coming through and, uh, and answering folks' questions and, and doing some really excellent work. OK, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next up, we have Diganta Mishra, who uh, will be presenting a couple of different interrelated ideas. Uh, uh, so Diganta is maybe best known for the MISH activation a self-named, self-normalizing uh, activation for neural networks. Uh, and actually, I had seen some of Degonta's work, and now Degonta's come to join Weights and Biases as an ML engineer. So that's very exciting. And I'm looking forward to hear what Degonta has to say on smoothness, robustness, catastrophic forgetting, and more. Awesome. Thank you, Charles, for the introduction. And first of all, thank you for inviting me, especially with Maitra on the panel, that's like a huge honor for me to share share the podium with her. She's an absolute inspiration for me uh, in my research field. And I mean, wow, the, the, her talk was really, really good. Like, I personally follow 
that line of work. So, um, and in fact, some of the points that I'll put up in, in my presentation right now would somewhat correlate to uh, her presentation. So it might be good to follow up on that. Um, all right, let me share my screen. Okay. I guess that should be up. Um, perfect. So um, in between, I'm, I might uh, shift to showcasing the actual text of a paper just to um, make things have more clarity. Uh, but we will go along with the flow. The um, the idea of this talk is basically to provide with questions and hypothetical scenarios that can possibly happen with current neural network trainings. So I really invite the uh, audience to actually brainstorm about those questions and and possibly think of a uh, analytical solution towards it. So uh, with that. Uh, uh, let's get started. So we'll start by watching a short video um, and we will we'll come to realize what, what this video is exactly uh, discussing about in, in the next few slides. So basically what you're seeing here are, are the loss landscapes of a ResNet 20 uh, having different activation functions. And uh, Basically, you're seeing the comparison between non-smooth and smooth activations like ReLU, Mesh, and Swish. So you can see like ReLU has uh, a very sharp uh, loss landscape and has a few saddle points while Mesh and Swish, the smoother alternatives provide a much smoother landscape, which is obviously very easy to optimize and thus leads to much better generalization as compared to its non-smooth counterpart. So um, this video was done with Javier Idemi, so big shout out to him. So now with that, let's get uh, into the actual stuff. So what's the idea of smooth activation? So uh, we have had in current neural network scenario, ReLU being probably the most uh, standout activation function to be used in all the different computer vision tasks that we can think of. And that's probably because of two reasons. One, it works very well. It's like universally works pretty well across all the different tasks like image classification, semantic segmentation, object detection, any drop downstream computer vision tasks that one can think of. And also ReLU is super efficient, super lightweight and easy to implement. And it also makes the whole training process much faster. But currently uh, we have had some very interesting hype around smooth activation functions. Uh, and what's the general idea? The general idea is basically that, um, okay, I guess this might be uploading. Uh, right, so the general idea is that we have activation functions uh, which have a smooth profile. Uh, by smooth here, I mean that uh, they are C1 smooth, which means that the first order derivative is continuous. And usually we would prefer to have a non-monotonic profile as well with the capability of preserving smooth small amount of negative weights because that's one of the key drawbacks of ReLU because it thresholds all the negative information to zero. So we have a significant loss of information. And that actually plays a huge role uh, when we are dealing with deep networks. So- uh, Deganta, I actually uh, figured I'd ask some questions through this talk and I actually invite uh, Mitra, I guess, if you have any questions, you can also pipe up. Uh, so I think of the the fact that ReLU sets a lot of values to zero as kind of actually a feature rather than a bug because it sort of says, oh, there's you know there's nothing here. Uh, there's only I can only sort of signal the presence of something. Uh, and so there's lots of uses of like non-negative matrix factorization where positive only is a useful idea. So I, I think could you just expand a little bit more on why people think this non-monotonicity in things like Swish and Mish is so useful? Great, so yeah, perfect. So uh, actually uh, there has been significant discussion around why make it you know, non-monotonous. If you are actually going to preserve negative weights, then you can go with the alternative like uh, leaky ReLU uh, or like a shifted soft plus, or, or you can go with other alternatives which, which do not uh, like collapse down to zero at minus infinity. Uh, it hasn't been very well explained in literature yet. At least I haven't found concrete reasoning behind the fact that why 
one would want to uh, possibly only preserve negative weights uh, in a small amount, which is closer to zero. But the general idea is that uh, the weights usually learned in, in a neural network are very much closer to zero. And kind of it's considered that weights which are farther apart are sort of outliers and not necessary. So the, to answer that question, uh, there hasn't been as a concrete reasoning on the fact uh, that why we would like a specifically non-monotony profile. But the whole idea is that we would uh, like to have a smooth continuous profile for activation function so that uh, when the optimization happens, the gradients are smooth and that actually plays a huge role, uh, not just in normal training, but also in, train, uh, in training of adversarial samples, which we'll get to next. But that's an open-ended question for, for the community to um, you know, really brainstorm about, to think like why we, we really prioritize on positive waves and, and only give a small amount of priority to negative weights in, in examples like Swish, Mesh, or uh, Gaussian error linear nets, or any other uh, non-monotony activation that exists out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that's a That's a great answer. I think the fact that the Swish activation was discovered by the sort of architecture search really, it, it really demands to be answered why that's so useful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, Swish, the, uh, the formulation of Swish was earlier proposed in uh, Sigmoid inverse linear unit. Uh, it's called SILO. And, uh, and even uh, GLU can approximate the form of Swish as well. So the, the uh, profile of activation function being non-monotonic and ha having that small amount of uh, negative weights being preserved is is still very much open-ended and we haven't yet figured out uh, in absolute detail about why we are doing that, but we can clearly see its benefits. Uh, and that's kind of outshining uh, and, and speaking for itself as compared to uh, piecewise functions like ReLU, which threshold the negative information to zero. So um, continuing with that, one of the examples that um, I'm going to shortly discuss about uh, in terms of non-monotonic activation functions is, is, a, is a function that I created. It's called MISH. And uh, it's basically a very, very closely related to Swish. And in fact, was heavily inspired by it. And the function is basically input into tan h of soft plus of input. And um, as you can see in, in the plot here, uh, it, it somewhat has the same amount of negative information being capped uh, in, the, uh, in the profile of the activation function. So uh, why is this important and, and why specifically are we looking at functions which, which have like this profile similar to Swish and Mesh? Um, so first of all, these activation functions which, which share the same profile as that of Mesh and Swish are really uh, more robust to uh, increase in depth of the neural network. And as I just stated before the start of the talk that some parts of my presentation will be highly correlated to that of my thrust. I think this is one of them that we can take some caveats off of it that we can probably experiment with my thrust idea and see if this actually holds out in, in the representation form that she discussed about. So as you can see over here, very basic experiment. We, we take a six layer neural network and basically have uh, ReLU, Mesh, and Swish as its activation functions. We keep on increasing the number of layers progressively. Uh, and we see that the test accuracy uh, significantly drops for ReLU uh, at an alarming rate, followed by Swish, followed by Mesh. So ideally you would want that uh, neural networks, which uh, increase in depth, should uh, uh, also have the ability to preserve its generalization capacity and not drop at the rate that Relu demonstrates over here. So, uh, so um, we got to a mm -hmm. quick question. Um, so yeah. is the training accuracy for these networks uh, comparable? Because one thing with depth, especially with, a not, with something like ReLU, there's not that it's not self-normalizing at all. And Swish is a little bit closer to self-normalizing uh, so that maybe it does a little bit better. 
Uh, but there's, I think there's a bit of a confound of like, how well are you able to train these networks that might be resolved with something like batch norm, for example? Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, I should clarify that all these experiments were done with vanilla settings, which means that all of the hyperparameters, the network uh, parameters were shared for all the three networks. So uh, we weren't providing Swish with uh, optimal settings that it actually requires to thrive. So we do have certain initializations that work better with Mesh, that works better with Swish, and that works better with Relu. But we actually chose for this experiment the uh, vanilla setting, which is uh, the default for Relu. Uh, and uh, in terms of training accuracy, uh, it wasn't comparable as you're stating. Relu was still lagging quite a lot uh, when we increased the uh, uh, number of layers in, in our network. Uh, but Swish and Mesh were somewhat comparable. Like Mesh was usually edging Swish. But again, this is not a very comprehensive uh, example to demonstrate that differentiating factor because it's still a very basic neural network and just on MNIST. So maybe adding more complexity will reveal some more hidden uh, details about, about how big or small the gap is between uh, the smooth activations, which is mesh and swish, and the smooth activations, mesh swish, and the non-smooth ones, which is relu. So um, again, this was not the main focus for me to experiment with, uh, but yeah. Since it is correlating to what Maitha discussed about, it's definitely something that I would be interested to uh, experiment with and see what the observations reveal. Okay, so uh, so what do we get with smooth activation functions? One of the prime reasons that probably users won't shift towards using smooth activation functions is that they are computationally expensive and ReLU is just too easy to implement and comes out of the box with most of the neural network packages. So it, it becomes obvious that one would rather try to just run the vanilla script rather than trying to find optimal hyperparameters for smooth activation and then using it in the neural network. But we can clearly see that it provides significant improvement in performance uh, over uh, piecewise uh, approximations like ReLU and Leaky ReLU. And, and that's that's also in like complex tasks like ImageNet. And we also see in this uh, experiment that smooth activations also fare very well when you use like different uh, data augmentation strategies like mix up or label smoothing or mosaic. And uh, so this basically speaks that we should rather transition towards smooth activation functions, which are comparable in terms of computational complexity to that of non-smooth alternatives like ReLU or Leaky ReLU uh, because of the significant improvement in performance. But that's not the only reason that we, we should consider these uh, smooth activation functions. Uh, before I go into the reason why, here's another of the downstream computer vision tasks that most of the users and academicians use to benchmark their neural networks. So object detection and MS Coco, and you can see that uh, in this example, Mesh is clearly leading by a, quite a significant margin as compared to Leaky ReLU. Uh, but uh, I should reiterate that uh, all these experiments uh, we did where we benchmarked neural networks on different data sets, we didn't try to find out the optimal hyperparameters for Leaky ReLU or Mesh specifically. We ran everything with the normal benchmark uh, settings that are used uh, and reported in uh, all the default papers in computer vision. So probably we expect that if we find optimal hyperparameters, uh, like as I said earlier, uh, a particular initialization uh, method that works very well with Mesh, we would probably expect to see a much larger improvement in performance as compared to what we are observing over here. So as I started with, uh, simple video about lost landscapes. Now let's, I think it's time to dive into why I brought that up. Um, it's really interesting to see uh, the performance improvement that smooth activation functions are providing as compared to ReLU or Leaky ReLU, but we wanted to explore what is happening actually and what's driving that performance improvement. So um, first of all, we take this example where we have a 
ResNet 20 architecture and we employ it with ReLU and Mesh. Uh, and we just visualize its lost landscape over here. And you can see that uh, Mesh has a much smoother uh, loss landscape as compared to ReLU and also has a lower minima point. So that essentially reflects to uh, better generalization. But the smoothness of the loss landscape correlates to much easier optimization, uh, thus not only resulting in performance improvement as compared to ReLU, but also converges faster uh, just because of the geometric uh, interpretation of the smoothness that we are observing by introducing uh, non-monotonic functions like mesh or swish. So this is, this is really interesting to see because uh, sometimes uh, performance metrics uh, is probably the only standalone metric that is used to compare uh, activation function performance and they might not reflect the actual thing happening in the background. So this really uh, consolidates that smooth activation functions are indeed helpful in not just uh, improving your neural network training process, but also uh, can allowing it to converge faster. So there's a trade-off uh, where you use ReLU, uh, which is inherently faster per epoch, but takes more epoch to train. But then there's Mesh, which is inherently slower than ReLU per epoch, but takes less epoch to converge. So it's it's sort of a perspective that you have to choose between which one uh, is the fittest for, for your own neural network setting, but usually uh, smooth activation functions stand out as compared to non-smooth ones like ReLU over here. Um, Diganta, a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, so the first one, this is coming in through, uh, uh, from a from a viewer, what was the motivation for the functional form for Mish? So it's there's like these nice motivations you've been giving in terms of of smoothness and in terms of preserving those negative values. But where did that uh, motivation come from, and what intuitions may you've gained in like finding that form uh, for Mish? So that's a good question because there's a really interesting story behind it. Um, in 2018, I, I was basically participating in a machine learning competition, in-house machine learning competition. And it, it was a task to simply build a classifier. And um, and my classifier that I was training, uh, although it, it, it was really good, it, it wasn't just cutting the mark uh, as compared to other submissions that were coming in. So I, I basically randomly searched up uh, what, I, what can I do in my, in my neural network that will probably improve the performance. And one of the uh, standout points that came up were activation functions and you can probably play around with it and change the uh, activation function from being ReLU to something more smooth like Swish. Um, so uh, I did play around with Swish then and um, in some of my problem tasks, Swish didn't uh, perform as well as I would have wanted. So I basically tried to formulate uh, functions which basically represent the profile that Swish has, uh, but at the same time performs much better. So as you can see in this graph, the formulations that I came up with are, are shown in the graph. So I came up with mostly a combination of uh, tan, hypotenuse, and softless, uh, because I found out that their combinations really provide a lot of different varieties of activation functions which can perform really well. And um, I did a search on that space, and I, I and from that search, I found out that Mesh uh, was uh, robust across all the tasks that I I trained all the different activation functions that I found in that search, and also it was uh, consistently better than what Swish was performing. So um, yeah, that that's the that's the starting point of where I basically found the functional form of Mesh. Although there has been future work on top of it to introduce like a beta parameter into the soft plus uh, component of mesh to allow uh, it to be trainable so that the non-monotonic depth that we are seeing in the negative side can be controlled and can be trained inherently by the model. But this is the general interpretation. You can obviously introduce that beta parameter, but it will obviously come up with its cost. And uh, personally, uh, I haven't seen much difference between uh, having the beta parameter introduced into the functional form, both in Mesh and Swish. Uh, 
Uh, so yeah, that's that's. I I hope that answers the question of where I got the motivation behind uh, designing the functional form of mesh. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any question? Any other questions? Yeah, I actually had one question I wanted to ask about these. So, you know, the loss landscape is in the end really a very high dimensional object, right? So there's probably tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of parameters in the neural network that you're considering here. And right now we're looking at the loss landscape in two directions. So I'm curious, A, like where do those two directions come from in this particular example? And then B, what attempts have there been to look at summaries that can take all dimensions into account to calculate uh, the properties of the lost landscape, like for example, it's condition number or something like that. Right, oh, well, that's, that's actually very interesting because when I was first uh, exploring lost landscape, I, I had the same question that it's a huge space and it's like probably impossible in terms of computational complexity that we have at hand right now to visualize that whole functional space uh, at an efficient level. So, um, so the loss landscapes that we are seeing over here right now is condensed and only uh, representative of the current minima that the weights are situated at. And basically the, uh, we track uh, the contour from the weight, uh, weights of the train neural network, but we don't interpolate the whole space because if you interpolate the whole space, then the problem is that you would lose uh, the details that we are observing over here pertaining to that local minima that we are settled in, but you'll have a general overview of the whole landscape. Uh, but if you focus only to the local minima that you're currently at, then you'll get to know actually the difference between the uh, geometric structure between the two landscapes around that uh, local minima that the network is currently uh, optimized to. So, uh, so, I think this was put forth in Tom Goldstein papers uh, at NeurIPS where he basically investigated the uh, difference of adding a skip connection and not adding a skip connection, which is the motivation behind ResNet. And we saw a drastic change in, in terms of the uh, smoothness of the landscape while the one which was not having the skip connection was pretty rough. The one which had the skip connection was extremely smooth and easy to optimize and and also generalize better. And I think that speaks for itself that uh, residual connections have been employed in mostly every given deep neural network architecture. So um, this is still very new uh, because lost landscape aren't like potentially explored to the possible limit. And probably because uh, people think that we are losing out on a lot of context by not visualizing the whole space. But again, it's understandable that we have to do dimensionality reduction to condense the space into this representation form where we are only visualizing the local minima because I, I think it, uh, because there are points which exist in the last landscape that you can probably connect with. I, I think this is relevant to generative neural networks where you have mode connectivity. So, but in this case where we're visualizing activation functions, we only wanted to see uh, the lost landscape surrounding that minima because that gives a sense of how easy or difficult the optimization process was. So um, yeah, so that's that's probably the the reason why we condense it to such a small area of localization rather than having a very broader bird's eye view. Okay. Um, so we, we did a uh, differentiate between uh, ReLU and Mesh, which is smooth and non-smooth. Um, but what's the differentiation between two smooth activation functions themselves like Mesh and Swish? So it's kind of tricky, but in this case, as you can see, Mesh has a much more wider and flatter minima as, as compared to Swish, which is a bit sharp. Uh, and that has been proven that wider minima actually leads to better generalization. Uh, and it uh, also speaks for the fact that in our experiments, we saw that Mesh actually was performing uh, consistently better than Swish, and that was validated in this, in this uh, visualization. So why are we discussing about uh, smooth activation functions? Uh, it's not only in the context of uh, performance in terms of 
accuracy or generalization of the neural network, but it actually also has a huge role in uh, adversarial training of neural networks. So what's, what's adversarial training? It's uh, basically, we have this image and we have corrupted it by some form of perturbation and then the network fails to uh, correctly predict that image which it was earlier before the perturbation. But as you can see over in this example here, the images look pretty much identical to at least the human eye and a human can visually interpret that both the images are of the same class, but an, a neural network fails to do so. So sort of like looks don't matter in terms of neural networks uh, as long as you do not uh, uh, corrupt the data and give clean data to the model, which it can clearly interpret much with a much higher accuracy than ones which are adversarially corrupted. So why are we discussing about adversarial robustness? Is because there exists this notion that generalization is inversely proportional to robustness. So usually uh, neural networks which are uh, adversarially trained with adversarial samples do have the incurring cost that they go down in the generalization capacity. So they lose a few percent of the accuracy, but improve in terms of their robustness. Uh, why is it exactly happening uh, was probably given in very extensive detail by this paper by Kanai Mellon, uh, where they basically investigated into the frequency components of the input that the neural network was trained on. So as you can see in the first figure, uh, the actual natural image is being predicted by the network, which is a ResNet 18 in this case to be a mobile, but when you reconstruct that image uh, from the low frequency components only, uh, which is visually highly correlated to the actual image, the network fails to predict the correct class and actually predicts it to be a frog in this case. Uh, but as you can see, if, if you put a human uh, in this case, uh, he or she would be able to correctly uh, classify both the original image and the low frequency reconstructed image to be the same natural class, which is mobile in this case. But uh, as you see over here, if we do a reconstruction only from the high frequency components, then the neural network is still able to maintain its uh, generalization capacity on that training sample and correctly predicts it to be uh, mobile in this case. And that's quite striking because we see that this high frequency reconstructed image clearly doesn't uh, visually correlate with the original uh, image that we had from the training data set. And why is that exactly happening uh, is provided in, as I said, in extensive details in the paper, but how's this correlated to robustness? If you see the bottom uh, charts that uh, are shown, you see on the left side, we have the kernels of a layer uh, from the convolution neural network, which is a ResNet 18 which is not adversarially trained. And on the right side, we have the same uh, layer from that same network, but it is adversarially trained. So we can see that adversarially trained neural networks uh, have higher robustness, but they lose the generalization capacity because the kernels that are learned uh, get smoother, which essentially fail to capture the high frequency components, which is essential to maintain the generalization capacity of the neural network. So this kind of gives us a good sense about why uh, there is an inverse proportionality between generalization and robustness. But uh, the caveat around that is that uh, we can actually bypass that inverse proportionality by using smooth activation functions. And uh, we can actually see in this result over here that using smooth activation functions, not only just improve the generalization capacity of the neural network, but also improve its adversarial robustness. So it's, it's a win-win situation. And this happens because uh, the activation functions do not put a constraint on the kernels to only learn, a, uh, only learn smooth features and, and thus will, be able to, will not be able to capture high frequency components, but uh, they, the conversion kernels can still get the actual feature representation, which is in the case of a normal neural network training. And 
are able to capture the high frequency components, which thus preserves this generalization or even improves it uh, when we use like smooth activation functions like mesh, swish, or smooth ralu or softness. Uh, in this paper by Google, uh, where they propose smooth adversarial training, they actually discussed various settings of how, how you can improve not only the robustness, but also accuracy, but at least the constraint is that do not drop the accuracy as we improve the robustness. And that's basically called free lunch in adversarial robustness. So you essentially don't incur any costs of improving your model's robustness in, uh, in its accuracy metric. And they did that by basically keeping the forward pass uh, of the network to be ReLU, but change the backward pass to be that of a smoother activation function. In their case, it was uh, activation function that they introduced called as smooth ReLU. So definitely would recommend to check this paper out because this provides a very interesting insight uh, onto why uh, the inverse proportionality between generalization and robustness might not always be uh, true. And there is definitely a work around it. And, and the solution is use smoother activation functions. So based on all the things we have discussed so far, we'll probably move to another domain in which is kind of gaining a lot of popularity in these days, which is uh, continual learning. And that is motivated from this uh, scenario that uh, occurs in neural networks called as catastrophe forgetting. So basically what happens if you have uh, a neural network being trained uh, sequentially on n number of tasks, uh, the network will perform well on, on the current task that it has been trained on, but it would have forgot the, uh, uh, the data set that it was trained on in the previous task, and thus it was not able to maintain the generalization uh, on the n minus, ta n minus one task that it had uh, been through before. So uh, this is not really a uh, 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 really in, like good problem to have around because essentially we want our neural networks to be uh, able to have lifelong learning capacity in them so that we can introduce new tasks to the same network and uh, ensure that the network doesn't forget the previous task that it had earlier trained on. So why is this important in the co context uh, that we are discussing right now? Um, before we get to that answer, it's just gonna quickly go through the current scenarios that we have in continual learning. So let's say uh, we have a data set which is pertaining towards task one for the neural network. And then we have trained the uh, neural network on that task one and it performs fairly well. And then we decide to shift to a new data set for task two. Uh, we don't want our network to be too plastic, which means that the network completely forgets the task one and just generalizes well to task two. We don't want it to be too rigid as well, which means that the network uh, not only forgets task one, but in the process also is not able to generalize to task two. So it hangs in the uh, mid ridge and, and is not able to work well in either of the tasks. We want basically to maintain a, a good stability and plasticity of the neural network, which basically means that the network should be able to learn new tasks efficiently, but also should be able to retain memory of the previous, previous tasks that it had been trained on and overall should be able to generalize pretty well. So based on this, what are we getting towards? So the stability plasticity dilemma is basically that we have a neural network which might be too plastic, which means that it forgets the previous task, or it might be too stable. That means uh, it, it basically uh, is not able to get a good representation for the, all the tasks that it is learning on and, and like kind of hangs in between. So what my hypothesis around, around this concept is that there exists one more parameter in that criterion which is uh, robustness. So we bas I, I basically call it a stability, plasticity, robustness dilemma. So the hypothesis is as such that if you have a neural network which is being trained in continual learning settings, and there exists a lot of them, uh, which have successfully demonstrated that they can tackle the problem of catastrophe forgetting uh, by retaining the generalization capacity of the neural network on the current and as well as the previous task which, uh, on which the network has been trained. But the question is, do these uh, training settings uh, 
also able to retain the robustness uh, of the model and not only the generalization. And if that's so, uh, does there exist uh, an inverse proportionality uh, between the generalization and robustness in continual learning settings as well as they exist in normal neural networks? So open-ended questions that I would definitely encourage the audience to consider experimenting with or brainstorming about is that if uh, this uh, dilemma exists, which is the stability, plasticity, robustness dilemma, then can uh, smooth activation functions or, or in general, uh, non-linear dynamics of neural networks, the key to solving this dilemma, because we saw, we saw earlier that they do remove that inverse proportionality uh, by giving you uh, the capacity of not only improving the generalization, but also the robustness of the neural network in adversarial training, adversarial training settings. So yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, all the related work and code and pre-trained models can be uh, made available on this uh, repository of mine. I can obviously put forth your ideas over on the discussion forum that I have in the repository. And I look forward to taking any questions. All right. Uh, thanks, Diganta, for an interesting set of experiments, papers, and ideas. I guess the um, the question I have is, so you presented some interesting intuition for how smoothness can help with robustness and help like preserve the uh, generalization capacity even when you're doing adversarial training. Do you have any intuition for why it might be the case that it would help with this trilemma of, uh, of being able to like still uh, help with robustness even when you're in the continual learning setting? Well, before I answer that question, I would rather like to put the hypothesis in more context. So what can possibly happen when you are uh, training uh, in a continual learning setting? Uh, let's say we have only two tasks at hand and we're sequentially training a deep neural network on both of the tasks. So we can expect uh, two things that, that can happen is uh, that the natural robustness of the model is lost, but the generalization is being preserved, which is courtesy to the continual learning setting that we're using. Or uh, it might be the case that the robustness is preserved for both the tasks or even improved uh, because of the fact that we are introducing more training samples and in return, we will introduce more adversarial samples to the model. So um, the direction, uh, about how activation functions or in, in general smooth functions can, can uh, improve the situation to avoid facing this dilemma is uh, around that uh, hypothesis of which of the results come to be true. A, a, that is the robustness is being lost or B, the robustness is being preserved and, and is actually or even is improved because of the introduction of new samples. So I can't really say on which of the either two scenarios will happen. Uh, and we are currently working on that to see uh, which of them is more relevant and actually happens in most of the cases. But my general idea is that essentially we want our neural networks to be uh, able to, uh, as I said, learn in a lifelong setting and not have that inverse proportionality uh, between the uh, generalization and the robustness parameter of, of the network. So, and the only solution that exists, which which can give you uh, that free lunch in adversarial training, uh, is smooth activation functions as, as showcased in that paper. So, my hypothesis is, if if is it is the case that robustness is lost, then introducing smooth activation functions in the training process of the continual learning setting will not only help to uh, improve the generalization capability of the network, but also help to retain the natural robustness of the model. But the context of it changes if if the other side if the other side of the coin happens, which is also very interesting to know why. Uh, obviously, it, it can boil down to simple uh, reasoning that uh, a we are introducing more data points to the network, so they are getting more robust because they are seeing more data points. But I believe that there might be more uh, things happening uh, under the hood that, that probably can explain either of the two scenarios. But 
if I am to put my bet on it, I, I would assume that robustness is being lost um, while generalization is being preserved in continual learning settings. Interesting. Well, we are, uh, I wanted to hear everything that you had to say. So we've gone quite a bit over time. Uh, so unfortunately, we can't continue discussing this. But I want to thank you for coming on and for uh, sharing your results and your thoughts with us. Uh, and I look forward to talking about this with you more in the future. Absolutely. It, it, it was such a pleasure to be here and talk uh, about my research with you. And especially, as I said, sharing a podium with my is an absolute honor for me. So, um, yeah, I would like to really, really thank you for providing this opportunity. And uh, I look forward to talking to people who viewed this and who have who might have further questions or or want to discuss some new ideas, yeah. Great, all right. Well, uh, to the folks on, on YouTube following our YouTube channel, make sure to leave some comments if you have any thoughts about this research. I think I'm also supposed to tell you to uh, like and subscribe. I'm sort of new to this whole YouTube thing. Uh, but thank you all so much for coming, uh, both to our speakers and to our audience. And I will catch you around at our future Weights and Biases salons. Take care.